Welcome everyone to the Dead Sea Scrolls, their story and significance. I'm a, I would assume that most people have heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, it's a very obviously famous document discovery of the 20th century. We're going to go through today the story and some of the contents and some of the kind of ideas behind the scrolls. But also we're going to talk about what is, what it is, what is its significance uh, in Jewish life and Jewish history. So in the spring of 1947, arguably the most significant archaeological discovery of the century, well, most certainly the century, but arguably of all time, was made in Israel. Of course, it was called then the British Mandate of Palestine. And the story goes that there was a shepherd of the Bedouin tribe of, tribe of Tamira. So he had a flock of sheep, and one of his goats was missing. So he was going around... Uh, the area to try to find that the missing goat and that particular part of Israel this is uh, near Qumran this is if you look at a map of Israel today you'll see on the right side on the eastern side south of the Jordan River there's the Dead Sea in the northwestern part corner so to speak of the Dead Sea there's a series of these rocky cliffs and inside these cliffs very hard to access there are bunch of little caves in the cliffs so this particular shepherd he assumed or he said you know he wondered maybe what his missing goat was in one of those cliffs so he takes a bunch of rocks and throws them into the cliffs and he hears a startling sound of breaking pots instead of a goat screamed out he hears this loud crash of an ancient earthenware jar being smashed so he climbs up and what he finds upon entering the cave, a mysterious collection of clay jars. He opens the jars, the majority of them are empty, but he finds in a few of them, you know, jars with the lid still on top of it, a bunch of old scrolls wrapped in linen and very, very old and very blackened with age. And these, of course, were the first discoveries of the Dead Sea Scrolls many of them in absolute pristine condition despite being more than 2,000 years old. Now the particular place where they were found is one of the driest places in the world, it's the lowest place in the world, and one of the driest places, very low humidity, very, uh, humil very low humidity, very low humidity, uh, very arid, and of course they were kept in these clay jars, so airtight, so remarkably scrolls that are thousands of years old, some of them maybe even 22, 2300 years old, are still in absolute and perfect condition. So he finds these scrolls and eventually they find a whole bunch of scrolls and the news uh, gets out and everyone starts running to comb the area, to scour the whole neighborhood to find scrolls. There's a little bit of a, of a rush, a little bit of a land grab a turf war to try to find these particular scrolls. Remember, this is at a time where the state of Israel has not been founded. It's a, it's, a, it's a year and change before the founding of the state of Israel. And eventually in that area, they found not one cave, but 11 caves in which there were the scrolls. The first one was called Cave One. Uh, the majority of scrolls were found in cave number four. There were more than 15,000 fragments of scroll found in that cave. In total, uh, they have found to date uh, more than 900 scrolls and fragments of scrolls in the tens of thousands. Some of them are kind of large pieces. Some of them are uh, very small. Some of them have writing in it. Some of them don't have any writing in it. They've been they, they've been erased over the course of history. But it's really like remarkable the trove of ancient documents that were found. Now they expanded the excavation beyond the initial area in Qumran in, in northwestern uh, in the northwestern tip of the Dead Sea. This is so close to the Dead Sea. You actually. To look online at pictures of these caves. So first of all, you see the just the cliffs, the limestone cliffs, and in the middle these these tiny little holes, little caves. No one would have thought to go look in there for you know almost you know it's a it's desert, it's middle of the desert, and there's just caves in the middle of the rock. But if you, you you could see online, there's pictures from inside the caves, and you see you're overlooking the water. It's a really beautiful 
uh, a beautiful like kind of vantage point to look at at the Dead Sea just laid out there before you. But they expanded the search area and they found all these different kinds of caves and all these different kinds of places. And uh, today, simply when people talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls, they usually refer to all the scrolls and all the scroll fragments found in that area and uh, the surrounding area as well. And in truth, we'll talk about this a little bit later at the end, there were other scrolls found, or the letters found, in what's known as the Cave of Letters, which come from a later point in time that come from the Bar Kokhba revolt, because Bar Kokhba and his soldiers and his armies were also hiding out in caves in the, in the Judean uh, desert. And those are often lumped together with, uh, with uh, these scrolls, and collectively they're also called sometimes the Dead Sea Scrolls as well. So the volume of scrolls is absolutely staggering. We're talking about more than 30,000 pieces of, of, of writing, uh, hundreds of manuscripts, many that no one had ever seen before, many that we have seen before. We'll go into, into them in more detail. All of them around uh, at least a thousand years old. Um, everyone seems to be in agreement uh, that th the time area or time kind of re uh, kind of the the era where these things were written uh, was before the Romans actually destroyed much of life Jewish life in Judah. So before the Second Temple is destroyed, and that's around already two thousand years ago. Now the people, the Bedouins that initially found it. They didn't know what to do with it. They tried to sell it. No one wanted to buy it. Everything was fake. They took out these scrolls. They rolled them out as if there was no big deal. Ironically, they survived for thousands of years untouched. And then the humans get their hands on it. And they start just opening it and twisting it and putting on tape because it got ripped. And these Bedouins even stretch them out on tent poles just to get a look at it. And unfortunately, many of the uh, many of the words got erased over over time, but the truth is the vast majority of them were kept in pretty good condition. Now they started selling them, uh, the initial people who uh, who actually found it, they were kind of stiffed. They were they actually sold it uh, for what is today about $37. Oh. That's it, and these things of course are, are priceless. Eventually we sold from one guy to the other guy. Uh, and the State of Israel, of course, was founded in 1948. And they managed to get their hands on seven major scrolls. So the majority of the content is tiny fragments. But there were a select number of complete scrolls, some of them very, very large. Uh, for example, the Great Isaiah Scroll, which as an aside, on um, this podcast, the Jewish History Podcast, that these classes are recorded in, uh, the, the logo, the background picture of the logo, is actually from the Great Isaiah Scroll uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And if you actually roll that out, it's about 25 feet long. It's enormous, the size of this, of this particular scroll. So, um, the first Israeli to really be all over this was someone by the name of Professor Elazar Sukenik. Uh, he managed to procure three of the scrolls early on. I think it was in 1948. He managed to buy it and give it to the state. Now, four more of the large scrolls were being peddled around. So, in fact, there's this great <laughs> classified ad from June 1st, 1954, in the Wall Street Journal that reads as follows. You have a picture of it here. Miscellaneous for sale. The four Dead Sea Scrolls, biblical manuscripts dating back to at least 200 BC are for sale. This will be an ideal gift to an, to an educational or religious institution by an individual or group. That was the actual ad. As, now, at that, at that point in time, they had already, like, its value was known. There were already books being published about them. Uh, what happened was that the State of Israel actually bought them. They spent $250,000, which in today's denominations is about $2 million and change, to buy them. So that was the last four. So they ended up with seven large scrolls that were part of the collection of the fledgling nascent State of Israel. 
And those names of those scrolls, because these, these all, all these scrolls have names, first of all is the Great Isaiah Scroll. What's remarkable about this scroll is that it is the complete book of Isaiah, all 63 wow. chapters, with almost none of it uh, missing or cut out or anything like that. Um, and it's word for word from the Isaiah scrolls that were always in our possession. They also had another intact copy of the book of Isaiah. There was a commentary on the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk is one of the minor prophets of the Jewish canon, of the Jewish Bible. So there's a commentary, a never before seen commentary on the, on the book of Habakkuk. And then there are f uh, four other books, again, books that had, or, or scrolls, that no one had ever seen before. One of them is called the Genesis Apocryphon. Apocryphon or apocryphal works means works of unknown authorship. And this is a, essentially it's a midrash. It's a commentary on the Torah. No one has ever seen it, seen it before. And then there were three other books that were clearly books of a different sect of Jews. One of them was called the Community Rule Scroll. A second one was called the Thanksgiving Scroll. And the last one called the War Scroll, sometimes called the War of the Sons of Light against the Sons of Darkness. Israel in 1965 built in Jerusalem a museum called the Shrine of the Book, and that was built to house these seven scrolls that were owned by the state and by the antique authority of the state. Now, what's more important uh, at least from a solistic or scholarly perspective, is not the intact scrolls, uh, it's rather the fragments, because the scrolls are pretty cut and dried. You get someone who can read Hebrew, you have him write it down, and you know what it is. The real work is in taking thousands upon thousands of scrolls, of fragments, that need to be put together like a puzzle, and you have to, you only get a sliver here and a sliver there. You got to, it's, a, it's an you know, incredible amount of work to just put it together and you only have little pieces and you have to really have a scholar who is an expert in these kinds of things to work on it. Almost all of those were actually seized by the Jordanian government. Remember, Jordan was the one that after the, after the War of Independence, they assumed control of what was uh, what's called the West Bank or Judea and Samaria and they had a museum known today as the Rockefeller Museum which is right on the outskirts of the old city of Jerusalem if you drive by the Shar Shem uh, and you take a bus going to the Kotel you'll pass by the uh, the entrance that Jews are usually scared to go and you'll see a bunch of uh, uh, policemen and uniformed uh, law enforcement and army there because it's a place where unfortunately there's a lot of terrorist activities but as you drive a little further on the left side you'll see the Rockefeller Museum. This museum was extant even before the, the Six Day War in 1967 and it was then called the Palestine Archaeological Museum and they amassed all the Dead Sea Scrolls, they put them in a massive scrollery, massive room inside there, they hired an international team of scholars that Jordanian did, did to begin the monumental effort of publishing the scrolls. Now the Jordanians themselves didn't really have much of an interest in this. Certainly uh, everyone knew it was of Jewish origin, a lot of, uh, all, you know, a lot of books from the Torah as we'll see in a little bit. Uh, it's all written in Hebrew and in Aramaic which is a sister language of Hebrew. Uh, but they had one rule, and uh, their, one, their one rule is that of all the scholars, none of them are allowed to be Jews. And ironically, the people most suited to be able to read and interpret and understand it are people that are Talmud scholars, because they, these books were written roughly in the same era when the Talmud was written by people who spoke the same language and wrote very similarly. So someone who is an expert in Talmud, or at least has proficiency in Talmud, would right away recognize, uh, of course be able to read it, uh, but they would recognize uh, what it means. I heard a story from uh, Dr. Schneer Lyman, who is Rabbi Mastery of Houston's father-in-law, and he's a big scholar, and he said that he spoke to one of the people uh, who was actually a part of the original team to decipher 
and deconstruct and reconstruct the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they said they found a scroll that said, uh, the first one was Chazon. So he said, that was the first word of the whole scroll. So they took out a book to say, which one of the books of Jewish books start with the word Chazon? And they found, of course, that many books start with that. Uh, many books of the prophets, especially Chazon Yeshayahu. Uh, the book of Isaiah starts with Chazon Yeshayahu. But this guy had to go to a reference manual to see which book of the Jewish Bible begins with the words Chazon. He didn't know. Like, these people didn't really have much expertise, uh, or they weren't necessarily the best suited to uh, do this work. And uh, the Jordanians essentially uh, hired only Christian scholars and a very small amount of people for what would have been an enormous, enormous undertaking. They initially assessed that to publish all of them, it would take roughly 25 volumes. In truth, to publish it all would probably be, amount to at least 100 volumes. But limited team size, people that are not necessarily the most adept at or the most qualified to to do the work, uh, and it was working. You know, they started publishing it at a very, very slow and snail's pace. Um, so that's essentially what we, you know the beginning of the story. In 1967, the Six Day War broke out, and on day three of the Six Day War, Israel captured the old city of Jerusalem, and as well they captured the Rockefeller uh, the Rockefeller Museum. And they essentially just commandeered the place, and they took everything that was there. And they said, okay, we finally got the Dead Sea Scrolls, which we believe are rightfully <coughs> ours. So t as of today, the overwhelming majority of Dead Sea Scrolls are actually owned by the State of Israel under the auspices of the Israel and Teach Authority. There are some of them hanging around in collectors and various collections around the world, but the vast majority are there. They took everything and moved it to the shrine of the book. But critically, they decided to keep the agreement that the Jordanians had, keep that same team on it. And again, the publication continued at a very slow pace. In the early 1990s, uh, there was an individual, a very famous individual by the name of Herschel Shanks. Herschel Shanks is the owner and publisher of the Biblical Archaeology Review. He's a very famous amateur archaeologist, and he made it his, you know, he made it his mission to get to get these things out. In fact, he was even sued, and he lost he lost the lawsuit. Uh, he had to pay a lot of money to one of the scholars because he basically just hijacked the guy's work and published it on his own. Uh, but he floated out this conspiracy theory that the real reason why they weren't being published is because the church, along with all the Christian scholars that were there, they found damning evidence against their religion and against their founder, and therefore they wanted to keep it under wraps, so they were publishing it very slowly. And that kind of it was an explosion that rocked the world, and Israel overnight almost changed its attitude uh, towards the publication of the Sea Scrolls. They expanded the team to over a hundred international scholars, many of them Jewish of course, and indeed by the year 2000 and certainly now the vast majority, over almost everything has been published. So that's the story of the scrolls. Now what about the scrolls themselves? First of all the big question is who wrote them? Uh, there is no consensus uh, amongst the scholars. There have been many uh, suggested uh, ideas or uh, groups. Uh, the most widely held belief that these were written by the Essenes. Now the Essenes are a sect of Jews that rise to prominence, or not to prominence, rise to infamy during the same period of the Sadducees. The Sadducees, like we spoke about last time, they opened the door for people to reject many of the basic precepts of Torah and of Judaism, and by doing that they actually spawned a bunch of copycats, people that took Judaism and changed it in a little way. Now, while the Sadducees, they shifted away from observance, becoming more like the Hellenists, 
the Essenes, they went in the opposite direction. They were convinced that the rabbis and the Sanhedrin, they were all corrupt. Of course, the Sadducees were corrupt. Everyone's corrupt. The vast majority of Jews, known to us as the Pharisees or just regular Jews, they had capitulated, they were too liberal, they were giving in to all the nonsense, they were tainted, and they were corrupt, and instead of kind of sticking to the way things always were, they made Judaism much more stringent. In fact, uh, until recent discoveries, no one had heard of these groups besides for the testimony of Josephus and other uh, historians from that time. Uh, he spoke a lot about them, Josephus, and he essentially pit he describes them as a bunch of uh, monastic communists, basically. Imagine communists that are disavowing from any sort of physical uh, life. That's basically what it was. On one hand, they're living in these communal houses, no one owns everything, everyone's eating together, they have all these weird rituals. On the other hand, there's no women anywhere. Um, they're obsessed with purity, multiple uh, immersions and mikvahs every day. Uh, there have been those that have suggested that many of them were celibate, some that got married, they had very strict rules of separation of the sexes, so they would get engaged and they would be engaged without any consummation for years and years. Uh, they believed in collective ownership, that very strong authoritarian leadership strict obedience to the leader. They had like a hazing process where they would, uh, where they would, uh, uh, in new, uh, new people that joined uh, would have to undergo this rigorous process of being accepted into this, uh, this sect. Uh, that's what Josephus describes. And indeed, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we found whoever this sect is, they have all these books, like a book called The Community Rule, which is the rules of the community. What, well, you want to join the community? This is it. That's why I call it, they called it the community. By the way, these books were entitled The Community Rule. Whoever read them, they're like, oh, I'm going to call it this. And then the next guy's like, I'm going to call it something else. And that's why all these scrolls have 10 different names, because every guy who touches it, it's like, I'm going to name it. Um, but the community rule, and so the names for, for it as well, that essentially outlines whatever this sect is, most likely the Essenes, maybe um, there are, there are uh, others, notably there's a, a, a religious orthodox professor by the name of Lawrence Schiffman, and he argues that these were nothing more than just Sadducees, maybe a more religious uh, strain of Sadducees, but these were Sadducees. That's what he suggests. Who knows? I, I don't think anyone really knows. But either way, this, uh, this group uh, sounds a lot like the Essenes. That's why it's uh, been accepted by most that these were Essenes, that this various offshoot of Judaism, very, very religious and very obsessed with purity. And they took Judaism, they changed it, they changed it to become more strict, and they would go and live in these caves in isolation, uh, maybe not a lot of women around, which would explain probably why uh, A, they weren't that popular, and uh, B, why they didn't last that long. <laughs> um, but that, that makes a lot of sense. Now, the contents of these books, like we said, there's really a lot of stuff. Um, and they could they, those scholars break them up into three, uh, three different categories. Broadly speaking, many of them are the Jewish Bible. The Jewish Bible, along with other Jewish books that were not included in the Jewish Bible, but are included in other canons, like in the Christian canons as well. Uh, but every one of the Tanakh, all 24 books of Tanakh, Tanakh, with the exception of the Book of Esther, were found. Uh, they found, for example, t 39 versions of Psalms. Uh, they found 33 versions of Deuteronomy, of Genesis, everything, everything with the exception of, of the book of Esther. Now, why would the book of Esther not be included? So it's possible we haven't just found, we haven't, just haven't found it yet. Uh, because the book of Joshua, for example, uh, we only have two copies of it. Um, there are good reasons to suggest why maybe this particular group did not accept the Book of Esther, because if you know historically, the last book to be entered into the canon is the Book of Esther. 
right? The book of Esther is written between the first and second temple era. Right after the second temple begins, that's when you have the men of the great assembly, and one of their missions was to canonize the Torah, the Tanakh. So they were the ones who made the judgment calls. Of course, these are great people. They're the Sanhedrin. They have the right to do that, but they made the judgment calls, what to include and what to not include. The book of Esther was 10 years old when they started their deliberations. Uh, and even the Talmud records that there were some serious reservations from the rabbinic perspective, uh, maybe not to include it. In fact, it's the only book of Tanakh that does not include the name of God. So it's not crazy to suggest that the, this group, whoever they were, most likely the Essenes, that they did not believe that this was a, a part of the Tanakh, and therefore maybe they wouldn't keep so many copies of them around. Maybe they had a few copies, but not as many copies. They wouldn't study it as often. Maybe there is a copy there, who knows, but we haven't found it quite yet. So that's one section of, of books. It's, it's, it's the books of the Torah, the same books we have today. You open up Genesis, you open up their version of Genesis, it's the same. Essentially, there, 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 there are very few differences between ours, the ones that we have today, the mass, what's known as the Masoretic texts, and the ones found in Qumran in the Dead Seas, in the Dead, in, in, by the Dead Sea Scrolls. Other books that are Jewish books, books that are quoted in the Talmud, for example, but not included in the Tanakh, like the book of Ben Sira. The Talmud many, many times quotes Ben Sira, known as Ben Sira or Ben Sirach. This was a book of lessons, but it was also a bunch of nonsense as well in there. And the Tal and apparently it was a very popular book during the times of the Talmud. So much so the Talmud says people shouldn't read it because it's just a waste of time. It fills your head with mush. And we we didn't have any copies of this for the longest time. Now, the greatest discovery of documents prior to the Dead Sea Scrolls was when they found the Cairo Gniza in the, I think it was the end of the 19th century. In Cairo, in a loft, one of the synagogues, they found the Geniza. Geniza is the process that we still follow today, where you have Torah, Torah documentation, and you want to, you want to get rid of it. You know, a few pages fall out of your sitter, what do you do with those pages? You have to bury them, or put it away, put archive it in a Geniza. So frequently they would do, they would take a corner off a section of, the, of a synagogue and use that as a Geniza. So in Cairo, they found what's known as the Cairo Geniza, a huge treasure trove of manuscripts that were put there most likely as a Geniza, but it was never discarded, it's still there, it was, it was found. So for example, in the Cairo Geniza, they actually found uh, works of the Rambam, written by the Rambam, and we know what his signature looks like because of the Cairo Geniza. Now in the Cairo Geniza, we found a few pages of Ben Sira, this particular book quoted in the Talmud, uh, but now, today, we have a full copy of it because we pieced the rest of it from the discoveries of the Dead Sea Scrolls. There's other translations of the Torah, Midrashim, like we mentioned, the Genesis Apocryphon, other books that we didn't have access to that may have been part of the collected corpus of the Jews of the time or maybe just this sect. Uh, but they also found religious sectarian uh, literature, like we mentioned, the Community Rule or Community Scroll, which is a book that is dedicated to understanding that particular community's way of life. If you want to be a new member, how are you admitted uh, in these communal meals? Uh, what does it look like? What do they believe? Etc. Etc. They also found, this is very interesting, a book known as the Temple Scroll. The Temple Scroll is the longest uh, scroll found at, uh, at Qumran. It's uh, almost 27 feet long. It lists the rules of the temple uh, and it lists a temple that has never been built and essentially they write in there, Solomon should have built this temple, not the temple he, he actually built. Uh, it's, it's a very strange book actually. You can look at it online today. Uh, Google and the Israeli and Teach Authority, they made a joint project to put all the Dead Sea Scrolls online in high definition, you could zoom in very closely. So last night, I was kind of scanning through it, and then one of the marks, one of the hallmarks of this particular temple scroll is that it actually includes a lot of the Torah in the same order, mostly, but then it puts things around in a different order and writes them in a different way, which was fascinating to me. And it's just an interesting thing that really sheds light on this particular community. They 
instead of it being written in third person, right? God is not talking in first person in the Torah. It's almost as if there's a narrator of the Torah, right? Vaidabar Hashem al Moshe Lamer. And Hashem spoke to Moshe. So Hashem, it doesn't say, and I spoke to Moshe. It says Hashem spoke to Moshe. That doesn't exist in this temple scroll. So you have entire sections of this scroll that are exact replicas of a section in Deuteronomy, for example. But you open it, and it's just written in a different, per, you know, different tense, different, uh, different, uh, you know, from a different person's perspective. I, I saw this last night. I'm, I'm, I'm just looking it through. For example, the parsha ki seitzei, ki seitzei la milchama alevecha. When you shall go out to a war against your enemies, unisano Hashem lo kachav yadecha v'shavisa shivya. So it says in every Torah scroll that we have. And you go to the war against your enemies, and Hashem, your God, will give them in your hands. What does it say in the Temple Scroll? Uh, when you go to war on your enemies, I will give them in your hands. It's almost as if God is speaking, which is interesting. Like, but of course, you have to wonder what they were thinking to do that. You know, it's to us, it's sacrosanct, the integrity of the text. You know, I want I want God to be speaking in first person. Let me take the Torah scroll, reorganize it. I'll I'll, I'll be a better I'll do a better job at reordering it. And I, oh, I think God should speak first person. But that is uh, an example uh, of the of that scroll. Uh, there's another interesting one that does shed light about that group, uh, a book uh, known by the very very exciting name of Four Q M M T. Every single fragment is given a name. The first part of the name is the number cave it came from, and then a series of uh, essentially like a long URL. Uh, but the reason why it's called MMT because the last line in Hebrew it says Mitzat. This is a book of Mitzat Maasei Torah, which means a, a, a book that contains a, a few of the laws of the Torah. And uh, there's arguments as to what it actually is, but it seems like it's a letter written by the head of this group, whoever this group is. Uh, they call him the teacher of righteousness, Mora Hatzedek. And he's addressing a letter to the high priest in Jerusalem. And he calls him the wicked priest. And he spells out the differences between these two groups. And they outline their perspective on, for example, the Jewish calendar. The Jewish calendar is a very contentious uh, disagreement between the, the rabbis and the Sidokim and the Pharisees, all these other groups. Because the Torah tells us that the Sanhedrin has to be the ones to oversee the calendar. And therefore, they would have to make a set of courts to, you know, to, uh, to interview and interrogate witnesses and the whole spiel with the new months and new moons and all that. They have a simple system. They're not working with a 364 and a half day, 365 and a half day solar year. They just say the solar year, we're just dropping a day and a quarter out of it, and it'll simplify everything. Because they say, you know what we're going to have? We're going to have a 364 day calendar. What happens to a day and a quarter? Who knows? But that makes things very easy, because that if you divide the number by seven, you have... <coughs> Uh, you end up, uh, you know, it's divisible by seven. So therefore, every single Rosh Hashanah will be on the same night of the, of, of the week. And every single holiday, every, all the holidays will always repeat on the same night of the week. And indeed, there is a teaching of the Talmud where the Talmud responds to this unknown group that they used to say that the, that the holiday of Pesach always starts on a, on a Saturday or something like that. Very strange. Um, and beyond that, beyond the various scrolls, they also found uh, mez uh, mezuzahs, copies of mezuzahs, copies of, of tefillins. Uh, they found many Jewish ritual bathhouses, which does support or lend credence to the theory that these people were ones that liked to frequently immerse in those, in those, in those baths. And in, not far away, we found also the scrolls of the Bar Kochba, and what it seems uh, that they came from, their origin story, is that they are uh, written by Bar Kokhba and his people 
during their revolt against the Romans in the year 130, around the year 130 of the Common Era. So, for example, there are military dispatches. And the Talmud actually calls Bar Kokhba with two names. Is it Bar Kokhba or Bar Koziba? So they used to call him Bar Kokhba, the son of a star. They said Bar, Bar Koziba, the son of a fraud. So what was his actual name? What did he call himself? Well, now we know because we actually have letters written by him. And it calls him a Shimon Bar Kosiba. So that was probably his name. He was a son of Kosiba. When they thought he was Mashiach, they said, well, let's call him Bar Kochba, the son of a star. Like the verse tells us, a star will emerge from Jacob, which is a verse that's referring to, uh, referring to the Messiah. Once he turned out to be a fraud, they took his name Kosiba and just switched the letters to make it sound like the son of a fraud, Koziva. But there's a fascinating letter that they actually found uh, in, that, in those caves, uh, and it reads like this. It's, it's addressed to Shimon, I'm sorry, to Yehuda Bar Menashe. I have sent you two donkeys, and you must send with them two men to Yehonah's son Bar Be'en, and to Maspala, in order that they shall pack and send to the camp towards you lulavim and esrogim, palm branches and citrons. And you, from your place, send others who will bring you hadasim and aravos, myrtle and willow branches, because what actually happened was it was the holiday of Sukkot, and he had a whole team, a whole army of Torah observant Jews, and they needed the, uh, the Dalaminim, they needed the four species of the holiday. And he writes, make sure that they are tithed, because the halacha is you have to have a tithe if it's, uh, if it's from Israel, and send it back to the camp. That, uh, that letter we actually found in the Bar Kokhba cave. Now, um, the Dead Sea Scrolls, so like we said, if these were written by the Essenes, it's really surprising uh, that we don't really have a Jewish response. If you look at the Talmud, it doesn't seem likely. Uh, well, unless if it was the Sadducees, there's a lot of responses to the Sadducees. Uh, but according to most, the Sadducees and the Essenes were different, distinct groups. And we find uh, rebuttals and debates and polemics between the rabbis and the Sadducees but we don't find the rabbis talking so much about these other groups, the Essenes. I, I want to suggest, perhaps, that the Sadducees were a real threat uh, because they were presenting something which is much more alluring. They were saying, well, let's join the Romans. Who needs all the trouble of being a Jew? Let's, let's just forget about all our beliefs and all our practices. We can be like the people of the land. That's a very compelling argument. Whereas... You know, a bunch of lunatics who want to live in caves by themselves uh, with, in celibacy. It's not exactly uh, necessarily a magnet for young Jews. Uh, but there have been those that have suggested uh, that there is a teaching in the Talmud that is addressed to the Essenes. And in my, in my opinion, it would lend credence to the uh, argument that I proposed. So this is the book of... Pesachim, talking about Pesach, and the halacha was that on the day before Pesach, they would bring, of course, the carbon Pesach, the Pesach offering, but they would also bring the Chagiga offering, another, another offering. So there would be two offerings, one a Chagiga and one a Pesach. And if the first day of Pesach was on a Saturday night, which means the eve of Pesach was on Saturday, that meant that you would have to transgress the Shabbos in order to bring your Pesach offering. Now, uh, in the temple on Shabbos, they would always bring sacrifices on Shabbos because the verse tells us that your latter supersedes Shabbos with sacrifices. That's not considered transgressing Shabbos. And that law would extend as well to the Pesach offering. So if, if the holiday of Pesach was on Saturday night, on Saturday they would bring the, pa the Pesach offering. But they would not bring the Chadiga offering. Chadiga offering would only be if the Passover Eve was during the week. That's what the Gemara says. And the Talmud says that there was one person who had a big problem with this. His name was Yehuda ben Dortai, 
and Dortai, his son, they separated themselves, they abandoned they, the masses of Jews, and went to stay in the south. They moved away. Why did they move away? They moved away if Eli and with this with the following argument. If Elijah came and told the Jewish people, he's gonna, when Elijah comes, I once we know the truth, Elijah's gonna come, the prophet Elijah, Messiah's gonna be here, and he's gonna come to the rabbis and say to them, How come you did not bring the Khadigo offering on the Shabbos? And what are they gonna say? I'm astonished that the two foremost sages of our generation, Shemaya and Aftalion, who were great scholars and great expounders of the Torah, have not told the people that the Hadidah offering does override Shabbos as well. So the, these people believe Hadidah offering overrides Shabbos, and they believe that the rabbis of the time, Shemaya and Aftalion, who by the way, were the dual leaders of the people, one was the Nasi, one was the prince, one was the Avbez, the the head of the court, the ones immediately, the, the Zugot, that were immediately prior to Hillel and Shammai, exactly in the time period that the Essenes are uh, alleged to have been hiding out in caves in the south. And they had a problem with this and they went to join some, or they went to live elsewhere. Um, now, the Gemara says, well, well what, what was the argument? How, how come they were so sure that the Hadidu offering supersedes Shabbos as well? So they quoted a verse, the verse tells us, you shall slaughter the Pesach offering to Hashem, flocks and cattle. Problem is, is that this particular verse describes flocks and cattle and larger animals. Now the halacha is that a Pesach offering is only brought from flock, from, uh, from sheep or goats. So how come it's mentioning cattle in this verse as well? The verse tells us to do the Pesach offering from your cattle. Well, you don't do from the cattle. So what's the cattle referring to? It must be, according to this guy, uh, that when it talks about the flock, it's referring to the Pesach offering. When it's talking to, about the cattle, it's referring to the Chadigah offering. And therefore, the fact that the verse puts these two together, it's telling us that there's some sort of equivalence between Pesach offering and the Hadidah offering, just like the Pesach offering supersedes Shabbos, so too the Hadidah offering supersedes Shabbos. That was his argument, and he, he ran away. He went to the south. And the, the, to me, the most interesting part is the Gemara's response. Rav Ashi said, and should we come forth and explain the reason to the view of the separatists? Listen, these people are separating themselves from the Jewish people. Why should we even respond to these people? Who are these people that we should respond to? Now, ultimately, the Gemara does provide a response to it. But either way, it's a very interesting attitude here. These people are not worthy of a response from us. Now, because the Gemara does bring the story, it does give us a response. But it shows that there is the attitude of the architects of the Talmud was that whoever these people were who separated themselves and went to the south, if they had joined another group in the South of separatists, they weren't worthy of our response. Now, incidentally, the Sadducees themselves apparently were worthy of responses because there's many, many teachings of the Talmud where they are given a response to the, Sadduc uh, to the Sadducees. There's debates, the Sadducees did this, and they responded, and they responded, and they responded. Apparently, the Sadducees were worthy of a response. This individual or this group was not worthy of a response, and perhaps the reason is because they were not a threat. A bunch of blithering idiots <laughs> that want to live by themselves in caves, why should the rabbis respond to them, especially if they're not really a threat to the continuity of the Jewish people? I want to take a few takeaways from the Dead Sea Scrolls, from the story, from the history. First of all, I think it does, you know, people who want to suggest that the Jewish connection to the land is a recent one, of course, that is idiotic and preposterous. You know, we have so much uh, physical remnants um, of the Jewish communities that lived in Israel at the time, but this, of course, is something that transcends everything. Written word and Hebrew, the same Hebrew that we have today, um, from people that were clearly pious Jews of some variety or, or another. Uh, that's pretty remarkable. You know, in the land which, you know, Secretary of State 
carry. He's lecturing the Jews that we are not allowed to live there. We have to take all the Jews out of there. And that very same land in the West Bank, Jews were already there 2,000 years ago, which I think is a compelling argument. I think another takeaway is, is, is the integrity of the text. Um, with few exceptions, the, the books of the Torah that we found there are identical to the ones that we have today. That really shows that you know, the accuracy that of, of scribes who are copying scrolls and that are thousands of years old, and you know what, we, ha we went thousands of years copying from scroll to scroll, and then we found the scroll, the original scroll, or one of the original scrolls of 2,000 years ago, and we compare it to ours, and it's identical, or virtually identical. I think it should bolster our confidence in the uh, textual integrity. You know, there's a lot uh, smaller distance from Moshe to the Dead Sea Scrolls than from the Dead Sea Scrolls to us. You know, we're about 2,000 years from the Dead Sea, too little more than that, 2,200 years from the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they're about 1,100 years to Moses. So they're twice as close to Moses as we are to them, and it's the same, which is pretty remarkable. I think there's also a third takeaway, and that is that groups that separate from the Jewish people, regardless of which direction they do it, uh, they're going to die out. They're going to disappear. You know, the Essenes, they wanted to be more religious. We'll be, oh, the rabbis are all corrupted. I'm going to go live in the caves with the Essenes. We'll be so stringent, and then for sure we'll survive. We're being even more religious. The Torah tells us that we have 613 mitzvahs, and we don't do 612. We don't do 614. We do 613. And indeed, of those groups, we had the Sadducees. Uh, they're gone. Uh, what did they want to do? They wanted to abolish Torah. We have the Essenes who wanted to add to Torah. Where are they? They're gone as well. And just us, the people that said, let's keep the Torah that God gave. If God gave it, maybe it's probably the best uh, version of it, don't you think? Let's not add. Let's not subtract. And that will ensure that we'll be the ones uh, to remain standing. And I'll take any questions now. When the two, uh, the, the, the people you told, they moved away because they had a disagreement with what was being said, um, do we know that did they have a discussion with the rabbis before they left? Or they just Apparently left? not. Apparently not. Uh, maybe it was a prevailing attitude of the time, oh, the rabbis are corrupted or whatever, because it was a really bad time for Jews. You know, they were living under the very harsh leadership uh, or rule initially of the Greeks and then the Hasmoneans for a brief period, but then the Hasmoneans went off, Sadducees everywhere, uh, a temple that's being corrupted, who knows what's happening, along come the Romans, the Romans they come and they impose their will, we have Herod who's a, just a, a, a demonic monster who's killing everyone, it's a terrible time to be a Jew. There are some giants like Hillel and Shammai and of course later on the Tanoim uh, but you could see why people were looking for other options or, or looking for excuses or looking to blame people or saying, oh, you know, there's all these problems. Let's try to reimagine the way things ought to be. You know, when things are great, you don't necessarily find an uptick in new movements. You know, people are just happy. A movement is born out of pain. And it's uh, unfortunately a very painful time. And there are a lot of movements that, uh, that see the light of day, but they don't last because they're not... They're not based upon truth. Rabbi, <clears throat> what is, could you explain to me what the Geniza is? Yeah, Geniza is a mitzvah. Geniza. Yeah, Geniza is a mitzvah. It's uh, a what? It's a mitzvah. And okay. it's it, actually a requirement. You know, if you have mm -hmm. a pair of tefillin that aren't being used, oh, okay. or a pair of, or a book, a Torah book uh, that, that got damaged, but it's still a Torah book, once something assumes holiness, it's a mitzvah, it's a, a Torah book, it has to be taken care of um, very carefully. So if you want to get rid of it, you would bury it, actually, like you would bury a dead person. Uh, it's holiness that's no longer useful, that's what you do, you bury it. Even the mitzvah that we have today, you have a mitzvah on the holidays of 
of, uh, of a lulav and esrog, what do you do with the branch afterwards? Mm-hmm. So there's a big problem, because you can't just chuck a branch into the garbage, use it for a mitzvah. Once you use it for a mitzvah, it, it, it obtains a high, heightened spiritual status, and therefore you can't, you know, some people wait, they burn it with the, with the chametz before Pesach, they try to do another mitzvah with it. But you mentioned that um, it was a, it what, something about not bearing, but you had a place... Yes, a geniza also means to be archived. Okay, archived. Yeah, so the Cairo geniza, thankfully they didn't bury it, because right. if they did bury it, it would be gone probably, and inaccessible for us. Okay, I understand that. Thank you. So I have a question. We have all this proof that we were there. Why is it so hard for people to believe that we were there? Well, what's your assumption, Wendy? There's a deep assumption in your question. Your assumption is is that people's I mean, they're political just writing history to suit their own well, purposes. And... People, uh, do you think that they're motivated by pursuit of truth? Is that no. the clearly not right? No, no. You know the um, the Quran is basically a just shameless rip-off of the Torah. Like any good thing you hear from the Quran, it's just taken from the Torah and stolen. You know, we, we have books that talk about the binding of Isaac that are 800 years older than the Quran. Yet, you open the Quran, it's not a binding of Isaac, it's a binding of Ishmael. How did that happen? They don't care. You tell a lie long enough, people start believing it. That was uh, yeah, Goebbels' true. line. Yeah. You just say the lie. And, you know, unfortunately, I think we see a lot, a lot of that in our politics today. Not to go there, uh, but but both sides, both sides, they, they they don't say what is true; they say what they want to be true, regardless of truth. Right? Truth is very often thrown out of the window. You know, we like to think of ourselves that we're motivated by truth, uh, because just the notion that we're motivated by something other than truth is very unsettling. But the truth is that to really be motivated by truth would demands people behave in a different way than they usually do. Mm-hmm. So, I, you know, I, I think it's very easy for us to point fingers at other people. What? How do you suggest that the, you know, that the Jews were never here? We have so much evidence. I, there's no evidence. What are you going to do, right? Nah, it's not true. So the whole thing's fake. You can say that, right? Is that pursuit of truth? No. But we do the same in our lives as well. You know, we also have a tendency to do that. You know? If we are we really motivated by truth, really, 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 mm-hmm. ah, we we read a Mishnah in chapters of our fathers. Mishnah tells us, how do you make sure you never sin? You know what's above you. You know where you came from. You know where you're going to. And you know, who, uh, and you know before whom you're going to give a uh, reckoning and an accounting for. Right? We're all going to die. We have to speak before God and tell Him why we behaved the way we did. But that's truth. Do we live by that principle? It would be great if we did. But we, we have inherent blocks. We have our biases. We have our desires. We have our inclinations. All those things are fake. They're all lies. But we adopt them as truth. They become our truth. It's my truth. Right? What does that mean? Someone can say, I believe that the truth is the Jews never had there. They came in 1947, 1948. That's my truth. That's what people are going to say. What are you going to do? How can you respond to something like that, right? So yes, I agree. It, 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 it's preposterous and it's, you know. I heard a story on NPR that they are starting to try and teach uh, truth in journalism in high schools because the kids get their news from Wikipedia or from you know, internet. just internet and, and there's so many lies out there that there's a whole group of people that are going up that don't have a, a concept of what's real, what's not real. Mm-hmm. You know, that mm-hmm. it's, it seems real whatever they're told but 